Today, we go to the subject of the spacecraft exploration of Mars. Quite a different story from the exploration of Mars using ground-based telescopes that we talked about in the last lecture. The typical interplanetary spacecraft of the present time is uh, a machine, uh, oh, about as big as this lecture table. Uh, it may weigh uh, a half a ton or a ton, something of that sort. Is launched by a large rocket booster from some place like Florida or Soviet Central Asia. Um, takes something like a year to go to Mars. About the same as uh, it took uh, British merchantmen to go to the Far East uh, in the 17th or early 18th centuries. The uh, spacecraft is unmanned. Unmanned missions are much less expensive than manned missions. They also are much more obedient. Uh, the spacecraft could fly by a planet. It could go into orbit around the planet. It could enter the planetary atmosphere. It could crash into the surface. There are some that are designed to crash. Most are unhappy if they crash. And there are then spacecraft designed to land on the surface of a planet. Mars has seen spacecraft fly by, spacecraft orbit, spacecraft crash, although accidentally, and spacecraft successfully land. Today, I'm going to be talking about the first space missions to fly by and orbit Mars. They were all called Mariner, and you can see there's some hint of that nautical exploratory tradition, even in the name of the spacecraft. And uh, the first was called Mariner 4, which went by Mars in 1965. Mariner 6 and 7 went by in 1969. And then the main subject of this talk will be what was found, the remarkable findings, by Mariner 9 in 1971 and 72. This is a model of a typical such spacecraft. This is, in fact, the Viking orbiter. Um, you can see the four big solar panels, look like panes of a, of a windmill, that convert sunlight into electricity to power the spacecraft. There also often is a battery, which can uh, drive the machinery of the spacecraft during times, for example, when the spacecraft passes behind the planet and so cannot see the sun. The spacecraft receives commands from the Earth with uh, a big radio antenna, and usually it uses the same antenna to send the data back via radio to the Earth. And all of the communication goes over this extremely long path, which uh, may be as much as uh, 50 or 100 or 150 million miles. The spacecraft has its own little rocket motor uh, and fuel so that it can adjust its orbit, uh, change its orientation, do things on the basis of what it finds. And then, of course, it has science. Here is a scientific payload which can scan. It's called a scanning platform. It has the ability to follow Mars as the spacecraft goes by uh, or orbits the planet. And here you can see two cameras, and there are many other instruments as well. The spacecraft typically could uh, last for uh, at least a year and maybe many years uh, in working mode. The spacecraft is to some degree intelligent. It has a computer on board. It has pre-programmed instructions. It has a long list of stupid things not to do, which it constantly checks out. Am I doing something stupid? Am I doing something stupid? Um, and uh, if it turns out that it is doing something stupid, it often knows how to correct that error. The computer can be reprogrammed from Earth so that the controllers on the Earth can decide to do something different. The controllers are in a large room in the United States at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And uh, looking 
continuously at reports from the spacecraft about its internal health, how well it's doing, if any parts are failing, if it has enough power, if the temperature is right, and so on. And commands are sent from this command center. The commands go via land lines to a large radio telescope. This one is in the Mojave Desert in Goldstone, California. It is 85 feet in diameter, and it will send a coded radio message to the spacecraft at Mars. And the spacecraft knows how to read and interpret that information. Likewise, when the data is sent back, which it is on a regular basis, it is sent back to such a radio telescope, which then uh, sends it to the scientists that are waiting in Pasadena for the data. There are uh, such radio telescopes for the United States, not just in California, but also one in Spain and one in Australia, so that as the Earth turns, there is always a radio telescope pointing towards Mars to be able to get the data. Now, when Mariner 4 first flew by Mars, in 1965, uh, it took 21 pictures, the first photographs ever taken of Mars close up. And it could see things much smaller than could ever be seen from the Earth. It could see things a few kilometers across. And what it found, essentially the only thing that was visible in those pictures, were craters. And craters at that point became an important part of uh, the study of Mars. Now, people know that the moon has craters. In fact, there are some craters on the Earth as well. And uh, it was very interesting that an argument soon was raised that said, ah, this proves that Mars has no life on it. And sometimes the argument went as follows. The moon has craters. The moon is lifeless. Mars has craters. Therefore, Mars is lifeless. Now, I hope that many of you will see that that is not a terrific argument. Um, and you can imagine various arguments of that sort that don't work. Uh, my eyes are green, my, o my nose itches, your eyes are green, therefore your nose itches, uh, and other arguments like that. That's not a good argument, but we heard it. In fact, we even heard the President of the United States a Mr. Johnson say that he was pleased to find that there was no life on Mars. And uh, the reason that he was pleased was because he said that uh, as a young man he had been frightened by a radio broadcast about an invasion from Mars, which uh, was uh, based in fact on an H.G. Wells story of the same name, and that uh, since he did not want an invasion he was glad to find there was no one on Mars to do such an invasion. Well, this uh, was a, uh, an opinion which could be heard expressed by others, including the American divine Billy Graham, um, and shows that not only are there people who badly want there to be life on another planet, no matter what the evidence says, but there are people who badly want there not to be life on another planet, no matter what the evidence says. And the proper posture of a scientist, I believe, is to find out what's really there, independent of what people want. What we wish to be true is one thing, and it's important for our motivations. But what is out there may be quite a different thing. And it is always, I believe, important to be humble and open and questing in face of the truth. Now, the whole question of craters is an interesting one. What are the craters and how do they get made? We know that there are a large number of uh, craters, let's say, on the moon. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to come around here, and for a reason which you will shortly...